Hi Grade 11s, this video is going to be on an introduction to the hyperbola. Okay, first of all, what is a hyperbola? A hyperbola is a function which has the following equation. y equals something over x. Obviously we're going to move this left and right and so there might be a couple of um, different things in the formula, but basically is there a number divided by x? That's what makes a hyperbola. Now the first thing to notice is the moment you have a denominator with x in, you're going to have certain restrictions that x cannot be. Because when you have a denominator, your denominator can't equal 0, otherwise your entire fraction is undefined, so it's meaningless. Now if your denominator can't be 0, it means x cannot ever be 0 in this particular instance. Now this um, way of writing it, if you have um, a constant divided by x, this is called what, what we tend to call something called a parent function. Now a parent function is the basic hyperbola. Before you've stretched it and translated it and reflected it, your parent function is your original function and all other hyperbolas will come from that. So basically your parent hyperbola is something over x. Now there's two different uh, kind of shapes that a parent hyperbola can take on. The first shape, now you should have done this in grade 10, we did point by point plotting. The first shape is your parent hyperbola could tend towards the x-axis and tend towards the y-axis in quadrant 1 and then tend towards the x-axis and tend towards the y-axis in quadrant 2. Now that's the basic shape if your value at the top is greater than 0. So for example, 1 divided by x, if you have y equals, or 2 divided by x, or 3 divided by x, anything where you have a positive constant at the top would have two branches in quadrant 1 and in quadrant 3. Remember when we did trig, we divided the Cartesian plane into four quadrants, and so we would have our two branches of our hyperbola in quadrant 1 and 3 if your k value is positive. Now the other parent function shape is what happens if k is negative. So if you had, for example, negative 1 over x or negative 2 over x. Now it's actually really simple because what happens when you change the sign of a function? It's basically just going to take this guy and reflect it over the x-axis. So what does that function look like? This is the other parent function. This parent function will have one of the branches in quadrant 2 tending towards the x-axis tending towards the y-axis in quadrant 2 and quadrant 4. So basically these are not different shapes. You can always think of you can almost think of this um, particular shape there as the original and then this second shape is basically a reflection over the x-axis. So there is only really one shape. The question is which quadrants are they in? So this is a reflection over the x-axis. So as long as you remember the original shape, it's quite useful to remember if the value is positive, which quadrants it's in, versus where the value is negative, which quadrants it is in. Now we'll do that when we do plotting. So those are your basic shapes of your hyperbola. Now very importantly, do we notice that the hyperbola has two important lines in it? These axes are called asymptotes. These are called asymptotes. Now asymptotes can be fairly complicated things, but at grade 11 level they're not particularly complicated. At grade 11 level in the context of a hyperbola, they are the horizontal and vertical lines that the graph tends towards as x tends to infinity. So asymptotes are the lines that the graph tends towards as x tends to infinity. Graph tends towards. Now I'm going to stop it there because actually the horizontal asymptote is as x tends to infinity, this graph tends towards the x axis, and as x tends towards negative infinity, the graph tends towards the x axis. Now, why does the vertical asymptote occur? So there's two types of asymptotes there's the vertical asymptote in this case, and there's the horizontal asymptote. Now, why does a vertical asymptote occur in a hyperbola? The vertical asymptote in this particular hyperbola 
is x is equal to 0. It's a line, a vertical asymptote is a line that the graph cannot touch. It cannot touch the y-axis. Now why can't it touch the y-axis? Because of this little concept right over here. My denominator can't be 0. So this concept creates a vertical asymptote because there is a value that x cannot be. So if there's a value that x cannot be, you will always get a vertical asymptote. And your horizontal asymptote in this case is actually the y-axis, I mean, sorry, the x-axis, so which is y is equal to 0. There's a horizontal asymptote. Now, why does that happen? Why would there be a horizontal asymptote at 0? Basically, what it's saying is y can't be 0. Now, why can y not be 0? So why does this occur? This occurs because if you look at this graph, let's pretend the graph was y equals 1 over x. Hopefully we're happy with the fact that I could rewrite that as xy equals 1. How have I gone about that? Basically I've multiplied this side by x, I've multiplied this side by x, those cancelled, and xy is 1 is a different way to write the equation of this hyperbola. Now why can y not be 0? y cannot be 0 because what would x times 0 be equal to? x times 0, no matter what x is, anything times 0 would be 0. So there is no ways on the face of the planet that if y was 0, there's no value that x could take on to make that product 1 which means there's no possibility that y could ever be 0. So that's why, pardon the pun, there is a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to 0. And don't forget there's an x asymptote, sorry, there's a vertical asymptote at x is 0 because x is not allowed to be 0 because it's in the denominator. So basically both of these asymptotes are occurring because it's a value that the graph isn't allowed to be. Now that's basically our parent function. What do we have to know about our parent function to simplify this? Basically you have to know that there's two different shapes. They're actually the same shape, but one is if k is positive and one if k is negative. And you should always be able to look at a graph and say whether k is positive or negative. The second thing we need to understand is you get two asymptotes, the horizontal asymptote and the vertical asymptote. In the parent function, they are at x is equal to zero, and y is equal to 0. But don't forget the moment we move up and down, those asymptotes would move. Okay, the last thing to tell you about the parent function is the parent ha function has something called an axis of symmetry. If I draw it in, it is the horizontal line that goes straight through the origin, and actually it has a second as axis of symmetry if I go straight through the origin the other way. So no matter what the shape no matter what the k value, there are two axes of symmetry and they're the same axis of symmetry. Just visualize that. Basically what it means is if you fold the graph along that line, you, the graph will fold onto itself. Now what are these equations? In the parent function, you have y is equal to x and y is equal to negative x as your two axes of symmetry. So y is equal to negative x and y is equal to x. Those are your two axes of symmetry. So, just to quickly summarize, there are two shapes, and we've now seen both those shapes. There's two asymptotes, the x and y axis, or x is 0 and y is 0, and there's two axes of symmetry, y is equal to x and y is equal to negative x. Okay, now, if we understand the parent function, it means that we can understand any other kind of morphing of that parent function. So let me just quickly erase these notes so I can write some notes under this next equation. Okay, so I've erased my other notes that were clouding this page. Basically what this page represents, what this formula represents, this is the general formula for all hyperbole. So once you have a parent function, you can move it left, right, up or down, you can translate it, and you can reflect it. So first of all, you'll notice instead of using a k, we generally use an a. And basically what I'm going to do is explain to you what does the A do, what does the P do, what does the Q do. Now, the beauty of this is if you understand a parabola properly, 
a hyperbola, the A, the P, and the Q do exactly the same transformations. So what does A tell us? A is all about the shape. Exactly the same as a parabola, where A tells you if it's a happy or sad parabola. Your sign of your A value tells you which quadrants your function, your uh, branches of your function are. So you either have that shape, or you have the other two quadrants. Now we did discuss this in the parent function, and it's exactly the same idea, except we're calling it A and not K. So what are my two shapes? If A is greater than zero, you have your branches in quadrant one and in quadrant three. And if A is less than zero, you have your branches in quadrant two and in quadrant four. So A always tells you your shape. Don't forget that the transformation from one to the other, that transformation is simply a reflection over the x-axis. So these actually are the same shape, but just one's a reflection of the other. So A is fairly simple. You can never look at a graph and see what A is, but you should be able to look at a graph and predict whether A is positive or negative. Okay, let's look at this minus P business. We should know from a parabola that this is a translation left or right. Now we should also know from a parabola that if there's a minus, you moved right, it's remember it's counterintuitive, and if there's a plus, you move left. Now you will remember from a parabola that that affected your turning point, and so your p-value in your turning point formula always told you the turning point. Now the thing with this hyperbola is it doesn't have a turning point, there's no such thing. So what does a translation left or right affect? Basically what this affects is your vertical asymptote because your vertical asymptote should be at x is equal to zero. But the moment you move something left or right, all the asymptotes also move left or right. So basically, if my asymptote was at x is equal to zero, and you move it two units, you move the entire graph two units right, the asymptote moves two units right. I often also think to myself, how do I find my asymptote? Well, my asymptote only occurs because x minus p cannot be zero. That's why my asymptote is occurring. So that means that x cannot be equal to p, which causes the asymptote at x is equal to p. So once we start you know, trying to draw our graphs and read equations from graphs, um, we'll probably get a little bit better at this. But basically, my asymptote occurs at x is equal to p, because if you move the graph left or right, the asymptote moves left or right. Okay, and again, if you know the parabola very well, we should know that Q is a vertical translation. So the entire graph moves up or down. Now, immediately I say vertical, you want to say that the vertical asymptote is affected. But carefully, if you move a vertical line up and down, it stays in the same place. So what is affected if you move the entire graph up or down? This affects your horizontal asymptote. Now your horizontal asymptote should have been at y is equal to zero. In the original parent function, it was at y is equal to zero. So if you move the entire graph up q, your asymptote basically starts at y is equal to zero, and then you move it up q units, or down q units. And so basically your horizontal asymptote lands up at being y is equal to q. So it's in exactly the same way that a parabola has an A, a P, and a Q, a hyperbola has an A, and a P, and a Q, and the functions of each of them are all the same. P is a movement left or right, Q is a movement up or down. A dictates our shape. It's just that you have to remember in a hyperbola, there's two different shapes, and in a hyperbola, the P and Q can't affect the turning point because there is no such thing. What they do do is affect the horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Now, this will probably become a lot clearer when we start plotting these functions and we start, uh, we start um, looking at getting equations from graphs. So this was just a brief introduction in order to get down the notes. What we will probably learn is we'll learn a lot more when we start practicing. So watch those videos next.